Our next speaker and the last one before lunch is Barb Jacobson from Basic Income UK. Barb is an advice worker at a small central London charity which helps people with benefits, housing debt and housing debt. Uh, she's been active in community organising since 1982, a coordinator of Basic Income UK and on the board of Unconditional Basic Income Europe, a network of organisations and activists in 25 countries. Basic Income UK is a collective promoting unconditional basic income in the UK established since 2013. Um, the title of Barb's talk today is Basic Income, A Step Towards a Resource-Based Economy. Please would you welcome Barb Jacobs. Oh, okay, fine. Hi. Okay, probably what I can start out with. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint um, for a couple reasons. One is that I didn't really know much about TZM when I was asked to do this, and uh, I wanted to sort of listen to what else was going on and... and Change, change some things I said, I was thinking about saying. Um, another reason is that I was completely tra traumatized by PowerPoint tra uh, presentations when I did my MA about 15 years ago. But I have to say that, that all the ones that I've seen today have been really lovely and I've, I feel really kind of like I've missed out. So, again. <clears throat> okay, how many people have heard of basic income? I feel they know what it is? Okay, right, all right, so there are enough people who don't know what it is. Um, the, the idea is that everybody get a, a payment, every individual get a payment. It's quite important that it be individual and also that it be unconditional in the sense that there are no work requirements, no means test, and no, no particular interest in, in uh, looking for work. Um, this idea is a very old one. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, how I became interested in campaign, uh, campaigning for it was that I was involved with a, a group in the 80s called the Wages for Housework Campaign. And what we did was uh, make, um, basically made, uh, work to make women's, women's unpaid work in, uh, visible. What had happened before that, work was only seen as something that you get paid for in a job. And what we were saying is that actually uh, the economy would collapse if women stopped working, stopped raising children, stopped helping elders, and uh, stopped doing the cooking and changing the nappies. Um, right. Uh, then I was, as, as um, James said, is that right? Yeah. Uh, as James said, I was involved with, after I left the, the, the Wages for Azure campaign, I was involved with a lot of community organizing, mainly around housing and health issues. Um, and sometimes quite uh, very, I don't know, very small kind of the issues are being dealt with, like, you know, how often is the rubbish collected? Is it, is it collected properly, et cetera, et cetera. I got a bit bored with that. Um, and then I, after the crash of 2007, I realized that after all of my sort of Marxist, uh, Marxist reading with Wages for Housework, because we were very sort of Marxist-based, but then trying to develop from that, um, <clears throat> I realized that I, I had never asked myself the question, what is money? And so that sort of went on, so I went on to sort of look at monetary reform and that sort of thing. And then um, at the end of David Graeber's book about debt, he talks about, uh, well, maybe the world actually owes us a living after all. And that got me thinking again about, about basic income. I'd heard about it about 20 years before, but kind of dismissed the idea. Um, and then, um, in 2013, when the, uh, there was a European Citizens Initiative about basic income, uh, we formed Basic Income UK and really have never looked back from there. So, um, the other thing is that I should say is that, is that I'm kind of from the Jetsons generation. So I grew up watching the Jetsons. I expected a three-day week. I expected flying cars. I had, and in the state, and of course, as you can hear, I'm American, so we, I, I had all of that kind of optimism uh, uh, that I grew up with. Uh, just a brief history of basic income. Um, it's actually a very, very old idea. Uh, it largely grew out of um, the enclosures that were, and, and the kind of move towards private property in the, in the 1500s. 
Um, it was probably first really expressed, there's some argument about this, but it was probably first really expressed by Thomas Paine in a book he, he wrote called A Grey Injustice in 1796, where he said that, well, you know, in compensation for uh, people being dispossessed from the land and from being able to subsist through the land, then everybody should be made a payment. Now, his idea was that um, couples, when they got married, should, should have a, a lump sum, and then uh, people People over 50 should have a pension that are free, uh, free and clear from other conditions. Um, and now, I mean, we, you know, and then since since pain, uh, there's been there have been a lot of different economists and thinkers and campaigners who've supported some form of basic income, including J.S. Mill, Bertrand Russell, who wrote a fantastic essay on in praise of idleness. Um, uh, Virginia Woolf it has a kind of basic income when she says that everybody needs, in order to create, uh, in order to make good creations, everybody needs a room of one's own and 500 pounds a year. Now, back in 1929, when she said this, um, it 500 pounds, the five. 500 pounds a year, if it was in today's money, would be about 20, 20 to 25,000 pounds a year. So that would do me. Thank you very much. Um, there's also, I mean, I was interested in the in the uh, resource. What did you call it? There was a particular resource-based society, but then there's there was another name for it. The natural, uh, natural law resource-based resource society. I was interested in those ideas, uh, particularly. Um, I don't know. I hope people are aware that that Buckminster Fuller had a had an idea about the world game, and one of his things was that we already have enough for everybody to live on. That it's that that really it's a matter of distribution, and the world game was about sort of putting all the world's resources into a computer, and coming out with like, well, where are the needs, and how can we how can we supply them in the most rational way possible? So you're actually building on a kind of tradition that's that's been going on. And Buckminster Fuller was also a supporter of basic income. He felt that uh, that that the need to earn a living was was a, was completely outdated and that really we should have a basic income to live on and be able to make the kinds of creations that it, or be able to think beyond beyond just um, just our jobs. Okay. Um, what I wanted, what I, what I thought about before I actually came here, what I, what I was thinking about talking was, was this whole question of money versus resources, and some of these ideas have already been mentioned by, by speakers before me. Um, I think for me, you know, there's the the money versus the real relationship versus what we are told, in this in the fact, and as as Frank pointed out, we are told that money is scarce. However, and then and then we're also told that resources are scarce. However, the economy operates as though, and this is what James is talking about, the, econ the economy and, and this kind of growth paradigm that we have, the economy operates as though resources are unlimited. Now, we know that's not true. Um, but I do believe, along with Buckminster Fuller, that there is actually already enough in the world for everybody to live on. So how do we, how do we sort of um, uh, put those two things together? Uh, so we have this kind of scarcity myth of money when we could when we could have actually as much as we need and this leads and in fact this is what leads to bad distribution of resources and to not de not developing the kind of technologies that we actually that we need to to carry on living on this planet um, <clears throat> consumption much of this is based uh, there was a question about that and whether uh, whether something like a citizen's income or a, or a dividend would would drive too much consumption, and I have to say, as as somebody who's worked in a lot of different things over the years, um, including being a waitress, uh, that consumption. I mean, and certainly in my experience, consumption is is often driven by stress, and I think this has also been scientifically proven, and lack of control. So when people, if people don't have control over their lives, when they, when they're completely stressed out about of, about earning a living, um, they'll buy things to make up for it, and that's what the what, that's what the advertising industry really relies on. Now, what basic income could do is relieve that stress. Um, I'll talk about other about actual plans for it and and what how they how they relate to it later. 
However, um, if you remove that, if you remove that element of stress of having, of worrying about where, how you're going to live, where you're going to live, how you're going to raise your kids, and all of that sort of thing, actually, people's consumption does go down. And I certainly found that in my own in my own case when I was a waitress, the only thing I wanted to do was buy food at another restaurant and be waited on myself. Okay, <laughs> and I don't know how people are nodding, so I guess that's a fairly common thing. Um, so, okay, so we have money as the only resource that's been invented by humans. And think about that. Okay, this is a resource, or you could call it a tool, but it is something that humans have invented, all right? This is not something that, that, you know, if you believe in God, that God came down and handed, or if you don't believe in God, that was just created out of molecules that just by themselves, a bit like DNA. It doesn't work like that. We created money as a tool, and so we should be using it as a tool for the best possible um, outcomes. Um, and one thing, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, okay, I'll talk about that later. Um, so, but the thing is, all right, in terms of getting to a moneyless economy, which I actually have a lot of sympathy with, um, is the fact that money in this, money is very embedded in how we actually relate to each other, it's embedded in how we deal with resources, and it's embedded in people's minds. Um, it, and, and, but that, a lot of that is because in this culture, money is the only gar real guarantee of freedom and rights. When you think about it, all right, if you want to go to law about something, you need money to do that. If you want to defend, if, you know, if you want to have a place to live, you need money to do that. If you want to eat more and more these days, you need money to do that. And, um, you know, when, when people talk about the right to do this or the right, you know, we've got to protect that right or whatever, when there's, you know, this sort of Brexit debate going on where, you know, people are, say, talking about the court of human rights and how we need that, well, actually, you know, you also need money to access those rights. And um, that's, that's, I think, is just the way it is at the moment. Money represents individual choice and power. And it also um, re represents collective power. And look at you know the, look at the the kind of thing that's going on right now between you know banks on the one hand and our communities and what we think of as, as communities on the other. And it's also finally about individual control over time. This is a big one, and this is for me. This is one of the main reasons that I support basic income is because I am absolutely clear that that people need much more control over their time before we can we can advance in as a species, basically. Um, let's see. Right. Okay. And one reason, another reason why I think you know we need to have. People need to have some indivi more individual control over money. Is that um, is the other thing? Is that where national money? You know, if you just took money away, what what actually happens is that people institute barter systems. If you've read David Graeber's book about debt, uh, what's clear is that money itself actually came out of of different form different ways of dealing with debt. However, where um, where money, where where there has been a money system, and then it breaks down, people tend to just go to barter. They don't necessarily go into um, automatic collective control over resources. Uh, there's another thing with basic income, which uh, which I think is important, which is is that it it kind of you can say that that it feeds into this, but on the other hand, you can say that it that it plays away, and that is that currently we tend to value people by how much money their activity attracts, or by how much access money they're born into, and actually these two interplay. Um, the contradiction that there's a contradiction in terms of socially useful work, and this has been mentioned before, um, and in the more and right sorry. Social, and the more, and but there seems to be this kind of inverse relationship between the more socially useful work, the more the more socially useful the work is that you do, the less money you get paid for it. Now you can look at at family life, you can look at motherhood, you can look at you know at the bottom, and the, some some of the things that we do, which are most fundamental to to society, are not paid for at all. And when they are paid for, they're paid for at the lowest rate, rates of pay, for the for the most insecure kinds of kinds of relationships. Um, and this, I've I've been doing some thinking about this because I've got another talk to do tomorrow, and. 
Um, and it's just, it seems to, it actually seems to not just relate to how we, we you know, work versus, work versus, versus the other things that we do, but it also seems to relate to what happens in corporations, um, what hap you know, what happens in other, other fields of life where the, you know, where the person at the top who is, you may, you know, may or may not be integral to what's going on is paid the most. Whereas the people who actually do the work of of, run, of of making sure that services are delivered or that the the company actually is doing something are paid the least, so I'm, call, I'm starting to call this the inverse rule. Um, right. Okay. So uh, in terms of basic income and and some of your ideas here, um, I do feel that when everyone gets the same basic. It, it's not me feeling this actually, there, are, there is evidence that when people get the same basic rate of money as, as a right, um, that those who have been less valued before, i.e. I, people with disabilities and women, see their social value rise and, and suffer less discrimination. This was particularly proved by recent pilot studies in, the, in India where um, with just a small basic income, and this is really a partial basic income, just the fact that everybody was getting was getting some money from it meant that um, people who had been neglected by their families and also particularly young girls who'd been sort of told to kind of hide and not talk to anybody really kind of came out um, were fed better and um, and and really felt much more able to kind of participate in, and were allowed to participate in in the societies around them. Um, and then pl there's another, there's an idea that's actually starting to emerge from the basic income movement, um, which is um, particularly by the women that are, that are involved with basic income. And that is that, that we need to replace what, what's now a market driven, what's su supposedly a market driven economy um, with, with a concept of a care based economy. The idea is that the economy ought to be based on looking after ourselves, looking after others and looking after the environment. And I think that's... That's a really uh, great step forward. Um, given how much money is embedded in people's consciousness, the need to get rid of scarcity, what we need to do is get rid of this, the idea of scarcity of money first, and then we can think about how to organize resources. I think it's like giving people freedom will then help us actually work together. Uh, people need to think about, and also and another good thing about, I, I find with basic income is that and certainly in, the, in all the different kinds of campaigning and, and uh, places where I've spoken about it. Uh, what I found is that basic income really helps people think about all the other things we can do. It's like, you know, where, say, with monetary reform, people, they don't, it, it's very difficult to, to get them to, to allow themselves to actually think about it. People sort of think it's too complicated, it's something I can't possibly understand. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But then, when you start talking about basic income, and they can imagine money in their pocket, then they sort of think, "Oh, yeah. So where does this money actually come from? And what do I, what you know, how do I get hold of it?" Basically. Um, and right. Yeah. So you know. So that that's the point. You know. Um, one of the things, one of the, one of the early interviews that, that I did with, with David Graver about basic income, um, he spoke about how there's been a kind of 30 to 40 year war on the imagination. And I think basic income, again, just sort of imagining money in your pocket, what you could do with it, um, how it could help you, how could it help others around you, um, really kind of breaks that kind of, that, that war. It's like a, it's like a blow for the imagination um, in a key way. Uh, just to say a few things about where basic income is now, um, we've, there's, I mean, not only is there a European uh, group set up, now there's, uh, there's basically a, a, a global movement for it. And if you follow um, basicincome.org, which is the uh, basic income earth network news site, um, <clears throat> that's really where, where most of the news is coming out, but it's really, uh, it's gaining a lot of traction in Canada. It's gaining traction in New Zealand. Um, there has there's been campaigning for it in Southern Africa. Uh, there were pilot studies in Namibia, and now the guy that was responsible for those pilot studies, uh, Reverend Kimata, is now head of the finance ministry, and he's looking at how to introduce basic income on a on a national scale there. Uh, there's going to be a conf the BN is uh, basic income Earth Network is having their next congress in South Korea. And um, 
in Seoul, which is very interesting, and, and hopefully that means that there will be more connections made between Koreans and Chinese, uh, the Far Eastern, people who live in the Far East about the subject. It's been spoken, um, people have been talking about it in the Philippines. Um, in Europe, uh, obviously there's been a lot of news about the, about the proposed basic income pilots in, in Finland, um, also in, in the Netherlands. Um, now both, I have to say, just to be very honest, that both, in both those countries it's, it's, it's not completely definite. I know the, the, the press has been jumping up and down about how Finland's about to pay everybody 800 euros a month tomorrow, right? but in fact that's not really the case. They've just come out with their, with their first report into, into studying how to do basic income. And uh, again, it's not absolutely definite that anything's going to happen, but we hope it does. Uh, in the Netherlands, um, again, there's um, it was what Utrecht that that really started talking about it at first. But actually, there are about 20 different cities in the Netherlands who are interested in running pilots. Again, whether this is this is really going to happen, uh, will will really will be dependent on you know how how things go with with the studies into those pilots um, I have to it's also a little bit unfortunate that that uh, most of the pilots both Finland in both Finland and the Netherlands um, they're talking about giving basic income only to people who are already um, claiming welfare support and um, unfortunately I think that that a lot of the the really the best things to come out of basic income in terms of community and in terms of people doing stuff together would be as if they they tested basic income with whole communities and not not just the poorest. Um, in this country, uh, and also, sorry, I should say in France, uh, there's been huge movement on basic income in the last sort of three months, basically. Um, there are peop the MPs of all parties at the National Assembly are interested, um, and there's a, there are there are a couple of regions that are very interested in doing basic income. So one of the things that we'd like to do with UBI Europe is uh, lobby for pilots that for the EU to pay for pilot studies in, in different parts of in different parts of Europe. Um, in the UK, um, things also have been moving pretty quickly in the last sort of few months. Um, well, I don't know if he, people may have seen in the news the uh, the Scottish National Party has has uh, passed a motion in support of the principle of basic income and wanting to look at at pilots about it. Um, the Labour Party, John McDonnell, uh, who's a, a shadow chancellor, he's been talking about basic income for a while, but he's actually since uh, since Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, uh, the last let's see, in February was the first time he actually started talking about it, and it looks like the Labour Party is actually taking it seriously. One thing that's interesting is that MPs on both sides of the Corbyn versus New Labour debate, if you can call it that, um, are interested in basic income. So there are some hope, ho you know, that that this might be something that would move the party forward as opposed to, you know, leaving them mired in their own muck, as it were. Um, yeah, obviously the Green Party has supported basic income since, the, well, has had basic income in their manifesto uh, since the very beginning. However, uh, it wasn't until last year's election that they really started talking about it and thinking about it. Um, and in January, uh, Carolyn Lucas put forward an early day motion, which is basically a discussion motion to Parliament, um, calling on the government to look at basic income. Um, I don't know how much people know about the benefit system, but we're also looking at universal credit coming in or not, <laughs> as the case may be. Um, what's really interesting about universal credit is that the report that uh, that that it's based on, the first part of that report is actually um, completely an argument for basic income, right? And then they get on to sanctions and how we actually have to beat people into work. So uh, what, you know, the obvious thing, the obvious thing to do to replace universal credit when it finally does crash and burn, which I have no doubt that it will, um, is, is to institute a basic income that is given to everybody with a national insurance number. So... Uh, that's really all I have to say, so if people want to ask me questions, please do. Okay. Um, I, I may just start off with a, um, a commentary of my own, if I may. Uh, positive Money um, have got some interesting videos about just how much money could be created with a sovereign creation system, uh, money creation system, and uh, Frank, if you back me up on this. One of the videos said that the QE in financial markets basically was like wasting 375 billion pounds. So that's how you pay for it. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, because that's very often the first question asked, and one of the one of the sorry one of the irritating um, things for me is this collaboration we keep talking about. This is a very obvious place of collaboration. So the minute someone comes up with that, you just say, "With the three hundred and seventy-five billion pounds," <laughs> and you know. And, and you can back up each other's arguments um, because then it becomes, uh, and also the simplification of the benefit system because we do have a right wing agenda in this country that just hates you sitting on your backside not working. Un understandably, because those people are working all the hours God sends to pay the bills, and in their eyes, you're sitting down and living off the gravy train. So I think that narrative has to be challenged, which seems like a bit of a mountain to me, at least in the r right wing media of this country wouldn't get on, on board with that idea straight away. So sorry for, um, for stealing, stealing some of the time there. Uh, let's take a question uh, from... Sorry, what was that last bit of your question? What are the risks? Well, say, for example, the inflation thing, all right, which is one thing that people always talk about with basic income. Um, what was shown in the, in the Indian pilot studies was that demand actually increased for uh, better quality goods. And as demand increased for better quality goods with the, with the availability of money, people actually started to supply those goods. So it didn't actually cause inflation, but it did cause it did uh, it did cause a lot more activity within the within the economy, and it also um, allowed people to to make better use of the land that they had available. So people where they where the land wasn't in use before, or where people were, uh, say, working for landlords or working on the on. Um, there's a word for it, and somebody will give it to me. I'm sorry. There's a like when you get into debt, and then you have to you have to work for you have to work off your debt. Uh, people were able to get out of debt and start working for themselves. So. Okay. Um, if we just uh, yeah. let's have another question. I don't think we've right. had one from you. Sir. Well, I mean, all you can say to that is that often we have, rather than evidence-based policy making, we have policy-based evidence making. Um, certainly, in the last 20 years, for sure. Um, <laughs> And I mean, what happened? What happened with basic income in the 70s? And it was tried out in Canada and the U.S. Or the, a form of it was tried out in the U.S. called negative income tax. Um, the wind changed. The the political wind changed. And what happened to the study in Canada was that the papers for it were buried in Ottawa, in a in a basement in Ottawa. And it was only in the sort of past five years or so that Evelyn Forget found these things, she's an epidemiologist, and got very interested in the effects of it and actually studied it. So, you know, the, the, the results of that study in Canada weren't really available until about five years ago, and that's one reason. Um, another, I mean, I have to say that one risk with the pilot studies that are being pushed at the moment is that we might have a similar situation where everybody's talking about basic income and we, we test it to death, and then, and then the political wind changes again and then we move on to something else, all right? And, that's, you know, that's where I'm at with that. And I also have to say that I, I personally feel sometimes that the pilot studies are, it's kind of a substitute sometimes for the political will, if you see what I mean, because um, there's, there's ways that people ask questions about basic income as though, you know, we need to test this, we need to, you know, test the effects on the, on the, on the, mar on the labor supplier, we need to test the effects on what people do, we need to, you know, all these sorts of things, as though giving people money would give them a disease, come on, all right, you know, it's not like we're giving people smallpox, it's not like we're doing a, you know, a new vaccination trial or whatever, okay, or letting, you know, modified bees out to the environment or anything like that. And you think about how much we've actually been experimented on and, and think about sort of, you know, say these current programs like Workfare and the Work Program, which were, there's tons of evidence against them, all right? There's tons of evidence to say this does not help people do extra work or any more, you know, get paid work or whatever. Um, and yet, you know, because they're politically, you know, they seem to be politically feasible to the political classes, then they get instituted and it has nothing to do with evidence. We're going to take one more question Sorry, from the lady yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah, 
Could you Sorry, speak could you up speak a little up, bit? Please? Yeah, or do you want my microphone? Oh, yeah. <laughs> One of the bases of the campaign is that people are actually more productive. Yeah. They have the basic income and maybe more happy, able to dedicate to their jobs to make mm. a life not only of a living. Mm. And this week someone put me a question. Uh, in this case, till what point the government can actually control the population with the basic income? That's interesting. I mean, it is uh, one of the big arguments that hap that's happening in the states between libertarians, all right? And and one of the th yeah. So, with one side saying, well, you know, the government's going to use basic income to control people, and another side saying, well, show me the evidence, all right? And I could say, I would say that, yeah, let's you know, let's see the evidence for that. Um, you know, I don't think the government can try to control people more than what they're doing at the moment with the current benefit system. You know, and and what we're actually seeing is that you know they're trying, they're sort of using the benefit system to promote this kind of really bizarre work ethic. Uh, and I say I call it bizarre. I'll tell you in a sec why. But the you know really bizarre work ethic ideology. Um, you know, despite the fact that, you know, it's been shown that when people are allowed to do what they want, they want to do work, they want to collaborate, they want to get together. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I have to say with the work ethic, I mean, it's really used against poor people. You know, we don't have the work ethic for people who, uh, you know, who earn their living through rent. We don't have their, you know, work ethic for people who, who earn their living, you know, merely through shares and investments. You know, those people can do what they like. And we don't, you know, we don't even peer into, well, how are they spending the money? Is it a good way that, you know, we don't even, we don't even control the banks about how they spend money. You know, so, come on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Um,